Wow. Hey, I, I heard that there are these two basketball teams in Connecticut that are still in the game. Congratulations on that. I counted the number of Tennessee teams in the game. <laughs> we're not doing so well this year. Hey, uh, well, uh, we're going to focus on this whole uh, area of sustainable youth ministry, but I'd love to kind of have a sense of uh, the hand we've been dealt today because um, I may redirect some of my thoughts based on how you answer this question. How many of you have read sustainable youth ministry, sustainable youth ministry? Okay, maybe about a third of you. So, um, so I, I can I can kind of bring you up to speed. It won't feel like too much review. Um, I, what I'd love for you to do at this point, you're still eating. Some of you, uh, those of you that are done eating, you can be more mobile. Um, those of you that are still eating, if you'd like to be mobile, it's okay. But what I want you to do is go grab a partner somewhere. Ideally, somebody that you didn't come with, you don't know. And, I, and we're going to use this graphic here, and I'm going to have you do a quick check-in question with a partner. So uh, get a partner, either sitting next to you, or, or some of you are really ambitious, and you want to stand up and find a new one. You don't like the people near you. <clears throat> okay, here we go. You'll notice that uh, on the graphic here, there are seven matchsticks. Um, I want you to, to describe with your partner... I want you to describe your ministry right now, your ideally your ministry with young people, whether you are actively involved um, or you are preparing to be involved or you, I mean, I, generally, um, if we are part of uh, the covenant community of believers, we are in the world of youth ministry. It is not about people that have a job title that says we're youth pastors, right? It is, uh, if, if we are a part of a church community, we are in the business of youth ministry. So when I ask you, how's your youth ministry going, uh, regardless of where you are, hopefully you've got one, all right? So uh, in one of these matchsticks, which are you, which is your ministry right now, and why? You have uh, 45 seconds both to check in. Enjoy yourselves. Okay, question number two, same partner, same graphic. But this time, what I want you to do is check in about how you're doing. Uh, as well, how, What's the state of your soul as one of these matchsticks? Okay, uh, starting with the person who spoke the less last time. Okay, go, you got 45 seconds. So come back together. I uh, want to do a quick sounding and just uh, maybe uh, one or two of you, just some reflections on any relationship between those two questions, anything you heard from each other that you think, as we're just sort of checking in as a community, what do you, what'd you hear from each other? One or two of you. Okay, you, you and your partner both sort of felt like, whew, not only the ministry, but my soul, yeah, youth ministry, youth ministry has a way of sort of sucking the life out of us at times, yeah. Oh, nice. You are, that's good postmodern thinking. I love that. Yeah. Uh, you can unburn out. Okay, great. Good. Uh, one more. Okay, so you've got a brand new leader, and so that flame is it's like, poof, we're feeling some, feeling some power. Great. Well, um, let me give you a quick outline for our, our, our romp through sustainable ministry. Um, there, there really are two words we're going to use for the outline. The first one is the word stuck. 
we're going to identify the patterns that keep churches stuck in their youth ministries. And actually, we've discovered these are very similar. They keep churches stuck in their children's ministries and their music ministries and their entire church ministries. Um, <clears throat> we're going to move then from stuck uh, because we feel like if we can identify those things, we can go, oh, yeah, that's, that's something maybe we can let go of. Sometimes we hang on and we really cherish those things that keep us stuck. And uh, you may identify a couple of those as we go through this morning. Uh, the, second, the second word we're going to use is the word systems. We're going to try to identify uh, a systems approach to ministry different than the traditional approach, which is let's hire someone who will carry all the weight. And so the pattern it looks something like this. Superstar, sacrificial lamb, sacrificial lamb, sacrificial lamb. Superstar, sacrificial lamb. Sacr and so... What happens is churches hire someone and they think that person holds the secret code. We've actually heard churches say to their youth workers, we have hired you to crack the code, right? It's sort of like, dun, 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 dun. it's just sort of this mysterious thing. If you get the wonder twins that can come in and solve this thing, then you're going to be great. Well, we're going to say, you know, that may not be the healthiest way to do ministry. We're going to look at a systems approach rather than a person-centered or program-centered approach. But to get started with stuck, I've just got two pictures that I love. You may not be able to see this well, but can you see this picture of stuck? Yeah, you can't really see, but, but she has a smile on her face as she's taking a picture here with the car that's stuck there on the, on the um, boat. Uh, what does that tell you about, about her? It's not her car. That's, that's exactly right. Okay, now, you're going to have to look at this one very closely, but I just absolutely love this picture. It sort of, it sort of grows on you. You got the kid who just, you know, I'm picking up my pen. It's going to be easier to stick my head through the back of a chair. And so, so you got the, the principal, the lunch lady, the maintenance guy with the hacksaw two inches from his neck, and then the kid's got a little lollipop in his mouth. <clears throat> stuck. Got to love that. Okay, you know you're in a stuck church if, if the problems that you're dealing with all begin with the words, we just. Uh, if the solutions to those problems begin with the words, we just. Um, anybody want to give an example of things you hear in your church when they say, well, yeah, I mean, we're struggling, but if we just could, what? If we could just afford a youth minister, they are not that expensive, actually. Um, if we could afford a youth minister, what else? If, you know, if we just had more kids, wouldn't that solve it? If we just had about 100 more junior high boys, that would solve so many problems, right? Yeah? If we just what? If we just could get a new leader. I mean, forget hiring. Uh, uh, you know, we just, if we just get rid of this one and get a new one, that would be awesome. Yeah. I, we had a, uh, an elder in our church. Uh, we were, I'd been there for about five years, and uh, we were in a pretty stuck place. And this elder came to me, and she said, Mark, honey, I believe if, that's the way you talk in Nashville. And <laughs> she said, I, I believe if we just got some more cute boys and cute girls, we'd be fine. <laughs> Forget the ugly ones. Let's just get the cute ones. That'll pretty much solve our problem. Um, <clears throat> I love this line. For every problem, there is a solution which is simple, neat, and wrong. <laughs> when you think about the systems of the body, ju well, just throw out to me some of the systems of the body. What, do you, what comes to your mind? There are 14 of them. Digestive, circulatory, nervous, endocrine. That was impressive. You pulled that one out. Yeah. Um, so let's play digestive system, okay? Um, <clears throat> let's just imagine... Imagine, if you will, my, my, son, my son likes to say, my dad tells all these lies about me simply by starting with, imagine, if you will. <laughs> and I may be, <laughs> it's not, not true. Um, um, so imagine that, um, that I, well, I actually have a, a world-class stomach. Um, I, I, uh, I've been training for, well, pretty much all my adult life to get this stomach at gold medal pace. If there were an Olympics for stomachs, I'd have gold hanging around my neck. I, I'm, I'm sort of the Greg Louganis 
of stomach competitions, right? I mean, I, I eat 100 grams of fiber a day just to keep that thing in perfect shape. It's unbelievable. Um, now, I have to tell you this other thing. Periodically, because I give all this attention to my stomach, I often don't attend to the beginning part of the digestive system, which is this oral thing. And, and I, well, I, yeah, I, you know, that whole teeth brushing and flossing, it's way overrated. And so I, I get these sores in my mouth, and they're just all, all you know, pendulant. It's so hard to touch. And then in my throat, I, it's hard to swallow because it's like razor blades. And then this esophagus thing, it's, you know, things go down, but they come right back up, and it just doesn't quite work in the right direction. And, man, but then if anything gets down to the stomach, whoo, it's magical. And then it sends it right out of the stomach and goes right into one of those intestines. But the intestines are tied up like Boy Scout knots and nothing. And then don't even get started back on this section. It hadn't worked in months. Well, um, I got this gold medal stomach. But let me ask you this question. What's the most important part of the digestive system? There you go, the system. Better to have mediocre parts that all work than to have one thing that's sort of the, the magical piece. And a lot of times in youth ministry, we are looking for the just, the singular response, as opposed to creating a process that works. Uh, we, we sometimes have churches call us and say, can you help us find a superstar youth director? And we say, you know, that's just something we don't do. Because it would be bad if you didn't find a superstar, but it's worse if you do. Because if you get one, you get hooked on the crack that that's how you do this. And you actually, you know, typically what happens with a superstar is they will inflate a ministry over the span of about 18 months or two years. What's the difference between inflating and growing? When they're gone, all the air goes out of it, right? Um, and so we, we say, let's just, we want to create a system or a structure where moderately gifted folks can really thrive. Um, moderately gifted folks like, you know, there are a few of you in here that are superstars, which is a challenge, right? Um, uh, but the, for the rest of us, um, we, we want to be in not just uh, responding with our problems with these simplistic singular answers. I'm going to give you a few quick questions that we hear in stuck churches. And when I say we, um, I'm a part of an organization called Ministry Architects. And for the last 12 years or so, we have been working with churches in transition in their ministry. We, we started out just doing youth ministry. And over the last, well, three or four years, we've started doing more children's ministry and young adult ministry. In fact... My friend Melissa Rao is in the back. She lives, raise your hand, Melissa. She has a lovely Ministry Architects logo on her computer. Um, and uh, she's one of our consultants who actually happens to live right around here. Um, but we, we work with churches in transition. And, um, and so we have sort of stumbled into a lot of these patterns we're going to look at today. Um, so here's the first one. In a stuck church, we hear people say, can you just keep us from failing? <laughs> well, um, a lot of times churches are so terrified of failing, they have such a need for it to be right and for it to work that they stop experimenting. They stop trying stuff that is new. And I got to tell you, if you want to look at, an, at organizations that are thriving, they are laboratorizing their, their mission all the time. Think about Apple and Google and those kind of places. They're always creating uh, ideas that don't work. Now, we just see the result of the things that do work, but in the church, we're often calcified and terrified by the possibility that we might fail. And here's a, here's, this has become one of my favorite quotes recently. It doesn't have to work for it to work. If you, how many of you are parents of teenagers right now? You, you know what I'm talking about? If you are a parent of a teenager and, and you feel like you are succeeding, you probably are on a mood-altering drug, <laughs> right? Here's the way parenting of teenagers works. You fail, and then you fail, and then you keep failing, and then you keep failing in the right direction. You keep failing, and then they grow up. And, it, and somehow, it doesn't have to work for it to work. Sometimes churches are hoping for an endless series of success to be their youth ministry. And in fact, 
And that very obsession is part of what keeps churches stuck. Here's the next one. Um, do you understand how different we are? Um, it's fascinating. In the 400 or so churches we've done these assessments with, almost every one, we have someone in a focus group that says, you don't understand. Our church is different. And then we drill down and we say, what do you mean your church is different? <laughs> they say, well, our kids are so busy. <laughs> You're right. You're a weirdo. Our, <clears throat> in our church, parents don't volunteer. <laughs> yep, that's strange. In our church, it's like, it's like it's, there's demon possession that has come into town. We, they play soccer on Sunday mornings. Unbelievable. Now, this one was my favorite. You don't understand. We're different. In our church, people don't sign up for things. They don't RSVP. I don't get it. Now, <clears throat> chances are, in your church, there's probably about 5% pure weirdness. And, it, and for that, I bless you, and I'll let you call that weird. But let's don't, let's don't explain away a less than thriving ministry based on the very same factors that are present in every thriving ministry, right? Um, I call it the trap of terminal uniqueness. Here's the next one. Will you help my church understand it's not about numbers? Do you notice how quiet it got when I said that? Um, if there is a way to get a, a group of youth workers nodding their heads like bobbleheads, say it's not about numbers. And we'll go, yeah, 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 yeah. Like the like the duffel puds in uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah, that's right. That's right, Chief. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, some of you have have heard this story from uh, read this story in Sustainable, um, but here's a here's a parable for you. And again, a parable is something that never happened. Um, I have these three children that that actually happened: um, Adam, Debbie, and Lee. Adam uh, is our oldest. He is seriously ADD, um, and uh, <clears throat> so we take. We take our three kids to Disney World. We say, um, be back at the flagpole at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock comes. Debbie's there. Lee's there. Susan's there. We got no Adam. I say to, I say to Susan, well, baby, it's 9 o'clock. Looks like it's time for us to head on out. And mothers, what does she say? We can't leave without Adam. And I say, listen, we have two very quality kids here. Let's just work with the ones that come. <laughs> Can we let that hang for a second? Let's just work with the ones that come. And she would say, well, sweetheart, we have three children. And I'd say, baby, don't you understand? It's not about numbers. <laughs> and she would say, well, that third one just happens to be ours. Now, different ones of us have different traditions, uh, liturgies, sacraments around our children. My tradition is, is the sacrament of, of baptism that we do with, uh, with infants as well as adults, but often with infants. In my congregation, we ask the congregation these questions. Will you, essentially, will you be faithful in the Christian nurture of this child and the entire congregation stands? By standing, we're saying dibs on the baby. That one's ours. Now, that doesn't mean that one's ours if they happen to show up to our meetings. It means that one's ours. And a lot of times what happens, because most people in youth ministry say, I didn't get into this for a bunch of administrative work. I didn't get into youth ministry to manage a database. And so, every time a new youth worker comes into a church, they do this spiritual discipline called purging the roles. You know this? And they say, well, if I, haven't, if I don't know this kid, we're going to take his name or her name off the list. They, they don't, they're not ours anymore. And we lump in the kid from Des Moines that came to the lock-in four years ago with the elder's son who uh, has been a part of the life of the church uh, since the kid was born. Because we just see it as trivial to worry about a database. In stuck churches, they say, oh, it's not about numbers. 
Well, it's not about stupid numbers, but it is about the right numbers. Bigger is not better, but clearer is better. And if you've got a shepherd that doesn't know how many sheep he or she has, that's a bad shepherd. Right? And in our work with churches, about 5% of them can tell us how many kids they have. We say, how many kids are in your youth group? This is, you know what the common answer to that is? Well, what do you mean by kid? <laughs> I don't care. However you define it, which ones are yours? Well, I mean, somewhere between 20 and 200. I mean, we, we've got the, it's in Shelby somewhere. It's on the database. We've got, right? Okay. Here's the last one. Can you get me out of all these political games? In stuck churches, youth workers are saying, you know what, I don't play church politics. That's just, I just don't do church politics. You know, in the dictionary, right next to politics, you know what the word is? <laughs> Ooh. The word is polite. I don't know if there's any etymological connection there, but it does seem like it makes sense. Working the church politics system is just being polite. If I have a class on sex with my junior high kids and some of the boys start messing around and ask really explicit questions and I don't call my senior pastor on my way home from youth group, that's not polite. How come? He's going to get a phone call from a parent and say, did you hear what they talked about? Now, there is only one species that is more uh, unsettled by... Uh, by being surprised than horses are, and that is senior pastors. Right? <clears throat> Working those sort of systems. In every church, there is a process that decisions get made, and it's not what's in the policy and procedure manual. There's a process that, that happens, and we can either work it or not work it, but we're, we're going to play politics well or play it poorly, but we're going to play it's like if I were to step into, uh, well, here, here in, in New Haven, if there were a big concert, if Bon Jovi were to come and play, would that happen here? Uh, if Bon Jovi were to come and do a concert here in New Haven, where would that be? Not a space big enough. The Yobo? Oh, the Yale Bowl. Okay. So let's just imagine that tonight at the Yale Bowl, I am, I'm there in the center. And I'm, it's, a, it's a big thing for me, and it's a boxing match. And I step into the ring, and I'm working the crowd. Everybody loves me, they, you know, because I'm, you know, you know, I'm a boxer. I step in the ring, and I look across the ring, and it's Mike Tyson from 15 years ago. Um, <laughs> before he started collecting Social Security. Um, Mike Tyson is there in, in the other side of the ring, and I cross my arms, and I say, I don't play political games. I don't play, I don't play boxing games. And then the bell rings. What happens? I'm out. <laughs> Cover my ears. I'm, I'm, I'm gone. It doesn't matter if I declare that I'm not going to play. I'm in the ring. And if you are a part of a faith community, there is just a way the, there's a way the game's played. And actually, I like the term game because it's, a, it's playful rather than it's not like this sort of sneaky, you know, passing money under the table to the music minister to make sure. You, no, it's, it's just work in the process, right? So that's a, those are questions you hear in stuck churches. Um, I want you to just take a look at this video. And you're going to process for a second implications uh, before you can. Whoa, that's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe
believe this. You gotta be kidding me. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's nothing else left to do. Let's see. Hello? Hey, don't worry about it. I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he can fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. At your table, you've got 30 seconds to process implications for ministry. Go. Okay, just a couple quick soundings. Uh, what kind of things did you talk about at your table? Okay, you got to... Okay, awesome, great. What else? One more. Okay, there, there is a sense of... Uh, all you, one, of, one of our values in Ministry Architects is dumb persistence. Just keep moving. I love that line. Just keep moving. Um, <clears throat> we're going to move from the stuck word into the system word. We're gonna, um, a lot of this grows out of, a lot of you probably familiar with Ed Friedman and family systems theory and generation generation failure of nerve. A lot of this grows out of, of that work. Um, <clears throat> the idea behind family systems theory is uh, that we change things less by trying to get other people to get with the program, but more by tending to the system or actually tending to our own, our own anxious presence at times. Um, one of the metaphors we like to use for that is the building of the dance floor. Most churches are totally obsessed with hiring a dancer, and we would say, uh, first of all, we've got to get the dance floor in place. Most trainings that you'll go to around youth ministry are trainings to help the dancer dance better. Maybe they can be better at their theology or they're better at their technique or they're better at relationships, but they're doing the right things. If we don't tend to the dance floor, something like this tends to happen. You'll remember that, won't you? Yeah. Um, so when we, when we think about building the dance floor, there are two components of that, architecture and alchemy. Now, architecture is uh, the more tangible stuff. It's the, uh, you can hold it in your hands. It's goals, it's mission statements, job descriptions, calendars, curriculum plans, recruiting plans, uh, MIA kid follow-up, parent engagement plans. They're just, they're things you can hold in your hand. Alchemy, on the other hand, is, is, is the feel. It's kind of this intangible ethos that breathes through whatever we're doing. And usually in the church, we think we are victims of the climate. We think there's nothing to do about the climate. Um, we don't have time to talk about both of these, and because this one, I think, is, uh, has such power to transform our ministries. I'm going to focus on alchemy. Uh, all those, those kind of systems and architecture use, use the image of building a greenhouse. You architect a greenhouse so that the climate inside can change. You become a thermostat, not a thermometer. You set the climate for your ministry. Um, I'm going to illustrate that for you. So put your stuff down and stand up. You're now done eating. I want you to walk around the room and I want you to greet as many people as possible with this one instruction. I want you to greet them as if there is somebody more important in the room that you really are trying to get to. Go.
Okay, freeze right where you are. Freeze where you are. Now, I want you to do the same exercise, but this time just a little different. This time, I want you to greet the person that you greet with this instruction. The person you're greeting is your best friend that you last saw when you dropped them off at the airport on their way to Afghanistan. They were a prisoner of war, and you heard that, you heard that they were dead. It's actually your mother. Um, <laughs> all right? Um, and you are in the airport to greet her as she gets off the plane. Go. <laughs> okay. Who who says New England people can't get crazy? Okay, sit down. What do you notice about the difference between those two exercises? What's that? Okay, time. Say, say more about time. So even though you knew you were being manipulated into this, right? You knew it was just a game. It was pretend. Um, you actually spent more time in the second one. And, and I love the phrase you use, because that person was important to you. You just met them, but yes, they're right in the... In the scenario, well, I just want to illustrate for you, that's, uh, that's just a quick picture of climate. Both of those had a climate to it. The first one was uh, sort, of, sort of stiff and artificial and were, uh, were really busy and moving. The other one is slow enough to make eye contact and, and to create energy. And there was, a, there was an interesting sort of childlikeness. I mean, it took a few seconds we to decide if we're really going to be into this. And then you started running across the room and jumping into each other's arms. It was, it was awesome. Has this ever happened before, Skip, at one of these colloquiums? Co colloquii? Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going, to look at, we're going to look at four stages to transform culture in your, in your congregation or your ministry. And I want to use the case study of building a volunteer team. Let's just say you're in a church where you say, people around here just don't volunteer. It just, you know, people don't volunteer. And I, there's nothing we can do about it. It's just the way it is. Now, I have, this, I have this $100 bet thing that I do. It's actually, it's on YouTube. If you, if you look for Mark DeVries $100 bet, the bet is if you will work our volunteer recruitment process and it doesn't work, then we'll send you $100. Um, the process works. What happens is people don't work the process and then they complain that the culture is wrong. But we can, in fact, change the culture from a church that says we don't do volunteers to a culture that says we got all we can handle. In fact, we have a waiting list of people that want to work in youth ministry. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? Okay, here are the four steps. The first one is, the first one is we trust the process. Um, is anybody here a bamboo farmer? Okay, well, then you'll, nobody, nobody's here to argue with me. I, 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 I looked this up on the internet, so I'm absolutely certain it's true. Um, if you go to your friendly neighborhood bamboo farm, and you buy a bamboo plant, and you plant it in your yard, do you know what you have in six months? That's what I thought. I thought, you're going to have bamboo like crazy. No, you got nothing. You just got this little stubby thing, just like you got at the Home Depot. And you're thinking, man, I don't know what's the matter with my bamboo. The Baptists, they have good bamboo, but I don't know what's the matter with my bamboo. Well, then you come back six months later, you know what you got? Nothing. Sticks. Then you, you come back a year later, you know what you got? Nothing. Three years into this thing, in the fullness of time, when... There's something that goes off in the little bamboo brain, and it says, it's time. It takes off. And did you know, bamboo can grow as much as four feet in 24 hours when it starts growing in 24 hours. It's like a junior high boy. <laughs> Do you know this experience? You said goodbye to the kid in May, and he comes back 
in the fall and it's a whole different kid? You, you got this kid that's been sitting in Sunday school for year after year after year? Boop. You know, you're asking the questions and they are not in the game. You go on these retreats, you have these moving moments, the fire, share your feeling, confess your, whatever it is, and you got then they boop, nothing's happening. You're praying for transformation in this kid's life, nothing happens. And then, then they go to that dang Episcopal church down the street. And they have a lock-in. And they say something like, you know, I'd never understood about God. It's like nobody ever told me this before. Right? When you understand that that's the process of spiritual formation, that it's not anything that's linear, that it is, it, kids are on their own timetable, you relax. Because you know that very few kids can withstand the relentless power of unconditional love. They'll crack eventually. We're going to win. This invites us into, when we trust the process, it invites us into a stance of openness and this sort of non-anxious, playful presence that allows us to be open to the work of God's Spirit and God's timing, even when it may not be ours. Here's the next one. Uh, we deliver results. Well, a great illustration. Um, you all are in a basketball season in a basketball state where, you know, when you talk about UConn, I'm guessing most of you are using the first person personal pronoun. How about our team? How about our boy? How about our girls? How about our... Um, if they're losing, you tend to call them they or those or that, right? It changes a community when there's a sense that something's happening. There's some momentum. You can feel it in a community. Well, and a lot of times you think, well, how does that translate into ministry? I mean, how do you know if you're winning in ministry? I have got some great news for you. You don't have to tell your church this. In basketball, there's only one way to know the score. And that's how many points are on the board. Football, it's how many points get scored. Soccer, it's how many goals get scored. In ministry, it's all up for grabs. So here's all you have to do. You just shoot your arrow and let it hit something. And when it does, you draw a bullseye around it and you say, see? <laughs> it's working. Something's happening. Woohoo! Um, that is, that is, in fact, a great opportunity for us. But often, we focus not on the places where we see God's Spirit at work, but on all the things that are not working the way they, we hope they would. Which leads us to step number three, um, embracing stories and metaphors. Now, um, have, any of you know the name Mark Schultz? Mark Schultz is a, is a Christian musician. He's on the radio some. And, well, Mark was... Um, Mark was a youth director for us for seven years, and he would write songs for our youth group for Youth Sunday. Y'all have Youth Sunday? You know where the kids preach and they do the program? So he'd write a song for Youth Sunday. And usually, uh, Mark's a, a real ballad singer, so he writes a lot of great stories. And, um, but he decided he wanted to have a song that sort of rocked. Now, that's a problem for First Presbyterian Church in Nashville. Um, because, um, well... Uh, let me just, let me just, somebody in our church had a spiritual experience one time. It looked like this. <laughs> okay, the whole physicality of spiritual, not, not, not so much there. Uh, it, in fact, contemporary music is anything written after the Civil War. <laughs> My first Sunday at, at the church is back in 1986. Um, I got in the pulpit and I said, let's pray together led the congregation in opening prayer. Between the services, the pastor came to me and said, Mark, I can't let you use contractions. <laughs> I'm thinking, who's having a baby? What are you talking about? <laughs> no, we say, let us pray. Okay, you, you, you with me? That's, how, that's formal. So Schultz gets this song going, and he has the kids kind of stepping and swaying like this. All right? I'm thinking, that's, that's okay. I mean, it's, a little, it's, it's you Sunday. Our church can handle it. But, I mean, really, for our church, this is sort of like speaking in tongues. 
I mean, this is a little bit crazy. And I've got these kids that are actually into it. It's one of the few times where the kids are actually singing and they're, you know, they're giving it some of this and they're, they're going. And I got these girls on the front row. And I don't know if this is true in Connecticut, but in Tennessee, sometimes people come to church not dressed for church. And so they're a little bit low or a little bit high or a little bit low. And, and so I got these girls on the front row and they've been taking dance and got this new move. And so while we are singing the anthem, they are going... And I'm thinking relocation is in my future. I will be leaving soon. So at the end of the service, I'm at the enjoyed it line. Do y'all have enjoyed it lines here? You know where people come by the pastor and say, enjoyed it, enjoyed it, enjoyed it. Yeah, so I'm at the enjoyed it line, and, and people are coming by, and they're very gracious. And then I see Marge out of the corner of my eye. And I know this was not her favorite. This is not her cup of tea. And she comes up to me, and I figure the best defense is a good offense. I say, Marge, I guess that doesn't happen very often, does it? (laughs) And Marge reached over and squeezes my arm. And she says, no, honey, but I hope it happens again real soon. Now, that story, I've told my church dozens of times. I say to them, let me tell you how you love your kids. This is such an amazing place. This is the kind of people this church is made up of. Dozens and hundreds of marges that just sacrificially love the next generation. Our congregation, like our children, live into the stories that get told about them. If we want to change the culture, we trust the process. We say, yeah, we're going to have all the volunteers we need. We're going to deliver some results. Did you know that this year, We doubled the number of volunteers we had. We had one last year and two this year, right? Then we embraced stories and metaphors. I got to tell you about Mrs. Johnson and the thing that she did on this this retreat. She was the first one up and the last one, right? All of a sudden, people begin to catch up with what that is. And then the last piece is we celebrate rituals and traditions. We take um, these processes, these steps, and then we formalize them, not just in a story, but in some sort of ritual. Now, it doesn't have to be a ritual that, that is um, logical or spiritual. <laughs> um, if we had time, you all could tell crazy things you do in your youth group that are just ridiculous. I grew up in Waco, Texas, uh, where it's the home of Baylor University, the home of Dr. Pepper. They're actually, are, uh, Baylor is the largest Baptist school in the world. And so there are more Baptists in Waco than humans. That's a statistic that's true. And and so in our youth group, our little youth group of 10 kids, um, we used to talk British all the time. I don't know why, Robin. We just did. What do you think we'd have for dinner tonight? I don't know. Perhaps we'll have tacos. Oh, tacos are delicious. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Our pastor's name was George. We called him by his Spanish name. Oh, hey, that was a lovely sermon today. Right? It solidifies a culture when you have little traditions. And sometimes they can be playful like that, or they can be like, we'd like to invite all our seniors up as we begin their senior year, and they step into launching into their future as adults. Right? Either one of those. Uh, I just, I want to give you this as as a roadmap for uh, transforming any aspect of your culture in your in your ministry um, we have come now to sort of the end of our of our time together and uh, I think uh, is that right skip and skip's going to come and maybe do some closing uh, a little special actually skip has prepared this is unbelievable y'all he has prepared a liturgical dance for you and uh, if you haven't seen skip in leotard whew, whew, it is it is the deal um, I do want, uh, as Skip's coming up, I do want to um, let you know, uh, everybody loves free stuff, so we love for you to have something free by the, before you leave, if you want it. Um, we have a little online assessment that we uh, let you do um, uh, on, our, on our website. You can get three or four people, or 20 people if you want. You answer these questions, it spits out a little report, and then uh, you get to process that with one of our consultants, if you want to. 
Um, but I've got these little guys here. You just fill this out and check the last one that says, I'd like to take the free diagnostic. It costs something online, but for you all, because uh, we're together, we, we'd like to give that to you. So um, <clears throat> back to you, Skip. Uh, I'll do the music. <laughs> Uh, we have an intention of keeping covenant with you. We know you've all got these processes, results, stories, and rituals to get working on, and some of you got to go. And I don't want you to feel uncomfortable about that, so we're just going to break. If you need to go, go on. If you just want another cookie or coffee or say we got plenty, go get it. And then if you can stay for a couple minutes, we'll have some Q&A with Mark, but we're going to start that in about three minutes. So thank you for coming today. Thank you for what you do. If you can stay, stay and we'll have some Q&A. <laughs> no, you're, you're much classier. But. Thank you. I'm going to have to go on.